it's always a joy when I get to go preach at another church. Um, not just because I get a break from Mike. We spend a lot of time together as he's teaching me. I absolutely love Mike. But also to know that I have a bigger family that's outside of just Santa Clara Church of Christ. And our family stretches across the whole world. So on Sundays, Saturdays, Mondays, kind of the way that the time zones work, it's almost as if at every hour of the Lord's day, the Lord is being lifted up across the world as the world turns. So as we're worshiping here this morning, there's somebody else in another part of the state. There's somebody else along this coast, along this time zone, that's also lifting up praise to God. And we have a family that's just so much bigger than sometimes we realize. And it's a joy to know that. It's wonderful. Open up to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6 this morning. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, which was our scripture reading this morning, you're going to find the Shema. And Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 1 starts with, with these commandments and these statutes that God is going to deliver. And it says this, now this is the commandments, the statutes, and the rules of the Lord that your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in a land to which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God you and your son and your son's son by keeping all the statutes commandments which i command you all the days of your life and that your days may be long when i was young um my family the way my family introduced the bible to me was with a picture book the beginner's bible it had little short stories in it and mostly pictures Almost everybody was smiling. Even if they were bad, they were smiling. And that's how my family introduced the Bible to me. They didn't start with the hard stuff right away, but they worked me into that. So I started learning on the stories, and as time went on, my dad knew it was so important that I learned the word that he would take me out to lunch, and we would have a cheeseburger and a Bible study. And he did this through middle school. He did this through high school. Even in college, my dad would take me out, and we would have lunch and a Bible study. And it was really important for him to do that because he knew that if he didn't teach me the word of God, if he didn't teach me who God was, I wasn't going to reap as much as I needed to know from the word. He took the time to do that also because his dad, my papa, knew it was important to teach his son the word. And so he would sit down with him and open up the word and say, this is who our God is. We're bearers of this word right here. And we don't just follow rules. This is actually our job to show the world how great our God is. We're not just in a system. We have a great God, and we're going to show the world who our great God is. And so let me teach you about who that great God is. The instructions that we have here in Deuteronomy are so important. Verse 2, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son, and your son's son. The legacy of the knowledge of the Lord is meant to be passed through the family. About when I was, I think I was 12 or 13, um, I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And there's a the river that runs through Albuquerque, the Rio Grande, kind of just splits the city between the east and the west side. And we grew up on the west side. And on the west side, there's like maybe one or two churches. And there's tons of people over there. And then all of the churches seem to have been built on the east side since that's the way the city was built across Albuquerque. And so when I was probably about 12 or 13, my dad thought it was going to be a really good idea if we went and we planted a church over on the west side of Albuquerque where there's almost no churches. And we did that. And it was really, really hard. It was terrible, actually. In my middle school mind, it was terrible because the church made up of like 15 of us. And five of them were my mom and dad, me and my two sisters, and then my two grandparents. And then the rest were people that kind of came from here and there and then the owners of the house where we met in their living room. So it was a really tiny church. And my dad's not a preacher. He had a regular day job also. And so he was trying 
to do his 40 hours to, of work, and then he would come and he was trying to preach some sermons. He's like, you know what? I have a son that needs to preach. And so at 12 years old, I'm trying to preach these sermons in this little tiny house church that we're starting. And it was really difficult. And I, and at the time, I hated it. I hated having to preach. I couldn't use the beginner's Bible. I couldn't use the pictures and just read the stories. Somebody had to teach me how to preach. And as much as I hated having the house church and as it kept depleting as my sisters ran off to college and got married and stuff, and that church dwindled and dwindled down to seven members and eventually dissipated, that was probably some of the, the best training that I had in my life because it was direct exposure. And as much as I dreaded Sunday mornings, especially the Sundays where I had to preach 10-minute sermons, five-minute sermons sometimes, that's where I had to learn. That's, that's where I got some really difficult practice. I wouldn't have known that if my dad didn't teach me just as my dad's dad taught him. He taught me. The legacy of the word belongs to the parents. And parents, it's your job to teach your children who the Lord is and that we serve a great God. As we move through our text, we come into verse 4 of chapter 6. And this little section right here is called the Shema. Shema means here. There we go. I'm back on the leaning mic. Shema means here in Hebrew. It's how verse 4 starts in chapter 6. It says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. We sing a song about this. With everything that you are. Verse 6, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. And when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You see, the word of the Lord was supposed to be everything that you are. You love him with everything that you are, your heart, soul, your mind, your strength. And not only that, it's everywhere that you go. It's when you leave the house, when you come back in. It's supposed to be on your right hand. It's everything that you do. Frontlets between your eyes. It's everything that you think about. It's what you see. It's your guide. It's what directs you. The greatness of the Lord is meant to be every part of our life. And that should be seen in every part of our life. It's our job to continue to teach the message of the Lord to the next generation. Because we get to see what happens when that stops. If you flip over to Judges chapter 2, Judges chapter 2 and verse 6, we have the death of Joshua. Moses trained Joshua to lead the people when Moses couldn't enter the promised land. And so Joshua has this great burden to lead an entire nation. And God leads him through this great campaign. And in verse 6 of chapter 2, we have the death of Joshua. Judges chapter 2 says this, When Joshua dismissed the people of Israel, they each went into their own inheritance to take possession of their land, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works that the Lord had done for Israel. See, all the people that knew Joshua under his leadership and the elders that directed them, they knew about the Shema. They knew to teach the people who God was. And when the children asked, they would teach them, this is what our God has done. And as Joshua dies at 110 years old, which was really young back then, and then as we move down into verse 11, it says this. Actually, let's back up to verse 10. And all the generation also were gathered to their fathers, And there arose another generation after them who did not 
know the Lord for the work that he had done for Israel. Just one generation later, and they don't know what God had done. One generation that misses out on the teaching, and they don't know about the crossing of the Red Sea. They don't know about where Moses came from. They don't know about all the great things that God had done and all these promises when the teachings seemed to dwindle away. The very next generation in verse 11 says, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them, and they bowed down to them, and they provoked the anger of the Lord. There's plenty of other gods in the world to serve. There's plenty of them out there that will teach the children they don't know the Lord already. There's plenty of gods that will make a person himself a god over the great God. There's plenty of bales to bow down to. Parents, it's your job to teach your children to know the Lord. Some of you here might be a first-generation Christian, which is a beautiful thing. That's wonderful. And there's many people that should be a first-generation Christian today because their parents didn't teach them. And so the other element of passing on the message of Christ is through discipleship or mentorship or evangelism. You see, Joshua had Moses to teach Joshua. Moses took advice even from his father-in-law, Jethro, and he said, whoa, you're going to burn yourself out if you, if you have to deal single-handedly with this entire nation. God has directed you to do this, but also have other men, wonderful elders, that are going to help you in this ministry. This is going to help you, Jeff, Moses. So Moses had somebody to kind of teach him a little bit about some things. Moses taught Joshua to lead the people. And then when Joshua and the elders died, there wasn't a great prodigy. There wasn't a great leader like them to continue to teach and to mentor the Lord or to teach people about the Lord from the Lord. It seemed like Joshua missed out on a discipleship opportunity there. Somebody else to be a great leader. And when that teaching stopped, it made it much more severe. Who's going to turn these people to the Lord that had learned from the person before God is wonderful, and he raises up judges and people that he's saying, come back to me, come back to me. But discipleship is important. We translate it as mentorship on this side of the cross. At the Great Commission, Jesus said, go and make disciples of me. And so as Paul brought on Timothy and Titus and everybody else that he wanted to train to be preachers, he said, you're a disciple of Christ. I'm going to teach you about who Christ is from the scriptures. I'm going to teach you how to lead churches. I'm going to teach you how to teach people how great our God is. He made him disciples of Christ, but he knew, Paul knew, that the next generation were going to be the next ones to continue to teach the church. The next ones that will continue to keep the teaching to deliver to the world who God is. Mike gave a sermon a couple of weeks ago, and before that, he was giving this long introduction about how he got to go see his family, which he hadn't seen in a long time, and as he got on the plane to fly out to Kentucky, I think it was, he was on the middle of the plane, and it was just him that had the aisle seat, and then there was a little six-year-old girl that had the window seat. She was all by herself. Six-year-old girl sitting by the window, she's got tears coming down her eyes and over the mask. And she was being transported from her mom in California to her dad in Tennessee. No one there to fly with her. And this was a usual trip for her to be passed back and forth between her parents across the nation. And so Mike becomes best friends with this little girl. They're playing rock, paper, scissors, tic-tac-toe, fun little games like that. And they're having six-year-old level conversations. And she eventually asks Mike, well, what do you do? He says, well, I'm a preacher in a church. It's like, I don't know what that is. It's like, well, I teach people about who God is and about who Jesus is. And she says, oh, I know who that is. I learned that in school. Probably went to a private school. 
but she had neither of her parents to teach her the Word of God and to help her to grow up to this teaching. We have encounters like that where suddenly we're the mentor. <laughs> suddenly we're the one that's right here that have the Word and somebody that doesn't know the Word is going to learn from us. And they'll be the next people that are in this church. The next ones that will raise up to lead churches. When I moved to Colorado from Albuquerque, I was about 23, and I needed a job, any job. And uh, so I started uh, work as an electrician, and I did that for a few years. And the more I worked as an electrician, the more I found out, much like Caitlin, this little six-year-old on the plane, people have an awareness of God. They kind of have an underlying knowledge of a God's existence or maybe something of the sort that they might think is a higher power, but they just don't have that kind of a direction. And the more I found out that people were just so empty and, and lost of something, they wanted, they wanted a God. They, they were starving for a purpose, really, that, well, it's, I'm going to have to be the one to, <laughs> to bring all of this up to everybody. And as I kept working on through an electrician and, and I decided that I wanted to, to go into this position into ministry eventually, and I started taking steps towards that, just the very fact that people knew that I went to church was a reason for them to come and talk to me and ask me all sorts of questions. And, and, and some questions are, are kind of normal and some of them are just like way out from left field. And there, there are some weird questions, but people are still thinking about some things and and I seemed to be the only person around that had some sort of Bible knowledge to teach them about some things. I had a few other friends that kind of went to church and they knew a few things. But then when you get into, into things that are just, that you have to say, this is the scripture. This is it right here. That becomes your job to know this right here and to mentor and to teach all the people that are around you. Discipleship and mentorship, that's your job too. That's not just between me and my family. That's your job too. The future of the church also relies on the next generation and you have to get them there. You have to teach them, this is the great God that we serve that brought the people of the Old Testament out of Egypt and delivered them and he can deliver you too from your sin. And this message is so important to passion. Legacy is important. Discipleship is important. They're both our job. And the hardest one is discipline. As much as I love my family and I love my parents, I got more than my fair share of spankings growing up. And my family kind of knew that if you were alone with dad and he was grabbing you by the wrist and he was pulling you into the one of the bedrooms, you didn't really want to be associated with that person with like one of my sisters within like the last 24 hours or you're probably going to get roped in, into that punishment somehow. And somehow it seemed to always seem to be me that was always getting punished. And for a long time, I thought I was just maybe, I don't know, the favorite child, but I definitely wasn't. I was just the most difficult child. And so this one time, my sisters were gone. They were at school. They were old enough. I was too young to go to school. At one time, dad pulls me into the bedroom. I said, son, I've got this box over here that sits on my nightstand. I've been working really hard to collect the 50 state quarters. You know, 50 state quarters? I've been working really hard to collect these. Son, I'm missing two of those states. You know where they are? No. Son, I know that you took those two quarters. Now be truthful to me. Did you take those two quarters? No. Son, why are you lying to me? I put this box right here and the lid never comes off of this box unless I'm putting a quarter in there. But I came into my room today and your sisters are at school and the lid is not all the way on the box. I know you took those quarters. And then it all came out. Yes, I took those quarters. Why did you take them? Because they were shiny. 
I just went out. Just took it. And so when it was really bad, my dad would kneel down and he would pray with me. It was almost like he was tattling on me to God before he would spank me. So this time, that's exactly what we did. He got on one knee. I said, son, before I spank you, we're going to have to pray. And the tears are just rolling at this point. Doom is guaranteed. And he says, Lord, I'm so sorry that my son is a thief and a liar. Please help me to be a better father so I can raise him up to be a better man of you. And help him to grow up to be a good neighbor. I'll follow you. And I thought I was crying then. As soon as he said amen, I was crying even more after that. The hand really came down heavy that day. As much as I hated discipline, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5 says this. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us. Yes, we have. And we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, so it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those that have been trained by it. I only have niece and nephews, and it's, it's a really big goal of mine to be the favorite uncle. And I think I'm doing really good at that. And whenever I'm hanging out alone with my niece and nephews and they start to get ornery and they're doing stuff that they, that they should not be doing, you know what I want to do? I just want to kind of like look the other way and not address it. But if I let that con behavior continue and to grow, they're going to learn that when they're with their favorite uncle that they can do whatever they, they want to do. And I'm, I'm not going to come down on them. And it's my least favorite thing to have to deliver them to their judge, to their mom and their dad for punishment. I, I, I don't want to do that. I would rather just have as much fun. I would rather them just be good and, and we can all have fun that way. And then I'll secretly give them ice cream or something like that with sprinkles. But when they do something that's wrong, I have to address it. It has to be corrected. Or they're not going to grow up to be, as it says right here, trained for righteousness to bear peaceful fruit. Parents, it's your job just as much to discipline your children. And as unfun as it is for everybody, it's training for righteousness and bears fruit in it. And not only parents, but me too. Self-discipline is just as important and maybe even harder. I have to be trained. I have to endure. I have to learn to be peaceful and patient and bear fruit. I have to learn to grow into righteousness. As Paul would say, I have to bring my body into subjection and make it my slave. Discipline is difficult, but if I don't have an attitude that reflects who my father is, who Christ is, who am I truly representing? Or am I truly representing him with my character? Self-discipline is just as much a good thing. It's difficult. Working out and dieting, that's really hard too. But once you start to grow into maybe a nutritional routine, which I haven't done in a long time, I'm not speaking from experience, 
or you have to start going to the gym and really build a structure around that, you'll notice that the rest of your life seems to develop some more structure and to grow into a discipline also. Just one area of discipline will overflow into the rest of your life. So it is with the spirit. One area of discipline seem, suddenly seems to overflow into the life. And then suddenly the training brings you into a natural character of bearing fruit and resisting the flesh. Discipline is a good thing. But it all started from God wanting a people that could reflect his character, reflect who he was, and show the world that he is a good God, not just full of rules and statutes and commandments, but this is the way to live. This is the direction to go. Teach your children that this is the direction of growth. Teach others, show others, raise them up so that they can know that this is the direction to go and that they can teach the next generation. This is the way to go into goodness. And this is that right here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your might, with everything that you are. Love the Lord. If you have fallen in love with the Lord, he's been greatly in love with you for so long. So much so that he even sent his son, who is so disciplined and so reflective of his father, that he went to the cross to die for your sins. And you can be an heir, a co-heir with Christ. And to that, if you want to be baptized today, if you have not already. Or if you've fallen into hard times, we have a loving God and a great, big, loving family that wants to help you through hard times and can meet you in prayer. I noticed also you, you all have a really long prayer list. And that's a beautiful thing. That's a wonderful thing because we are people of prayer and we talk to a real God who produces real healings and real results through his power. And we rely on that great God. And he wants you to rely on him. He wants that relationship. If you want to know more about the Lord, we have plenty of answers from his word where he reveals himself to us. Won't you make your need be known right now? Let's pray.